Okay. I think what we'll do is we'll start now. And if anyone joins in, so be it. Okay, so <clears throat> just a brief introduction from me. I am Malcolm Fenn. I am the sole geography teacher here at Newham Sixth Form College. I've been teaching here since about, well, since exactly January 2016. Uh, I'm part-time here. I teach two and a half days a week. My main area of work here in the college is teaching geography. I teach the A1 group and the A2 group. Um, before starting here, um, I was for many years head of sixth form at a big comprehensive in northeast London called Wanstead High School. But I've come here, as I said, in the last few years. So um, that's me. And what I want to do now is two main things. Tell you a bit about the course, but not too much. Uh, and then give you a, a sample of what um, an important part of the course is like and the sorts of things we investigate. So without further ado, oh, by the way, I want to introduce on the... Uh, the um, list of people who are here today, Noor is one of our current uh, A1 students. So she is here in that capacity. We may have one or two others joining us. So let me go to present now. And you should be Shortly seeing a whole screen. Good. Right. So let's go. Okay, so this is part of the summer induction program. Um, we are um, as a college introducing you to various aspects of what we offer here um, at the college. And obviously the part I'm looking at is the A-level program. Humanities includes history, geography, politics. Spanish, the religious studies, but we're part of a wider program. Um, so. It's delivered and I'll give you a sample of part of the course. Why is geography interesting and relevant to a young person? I kind of fell in love with geography when I was in my mid-teens. I had a particularly inspirational teacher and she really kind of got me into it, I suppose. Field trips added to that and what I particularly like about the subject is that you can look at anything that's happening in the world at all sorts of different scales and geography has always got something to tell you about that, to help you understand, to explain what's going on. How will it equip you as young people at a particular stage in your academic life with the future? Geography is really a subject that uh, revels in the complexity of the world, how things are interrelated, how physical features on the planet's surface are formed, how they affect our human uh, civilization on the planet has grown and developed, and how that occurs in the news on a day-to-day -day basis about now and about what's going to be happening in the future. Geography has something to say about that. Geography brings it together, whether it be climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, sustainable use of resources, population change. Geography is really in there. People draw links between those different things. As you can see, we have a, a powerful admirer 
in Barack Obama. What's the, the value of the subject? What's the intrinsic worth of the subject? Well, it helps us to understand and resolve issues. Those issues are diverse. They're often interconnected. Um, I see it has the edge on other subjects which aren't so interconnected. Physics, chemistry, biology, politics, they are sort of in their own particular little bubbles. They've got a great deal to say. They're very detailed. They're very useful. But it's that linkage between things, which I think geography is especially good at. People I grew up with also studying geography have gone on to do all sorts of different things, teaching, obviously. But one is now a professor of planning in Hong Kong University. He oversees a department where people are thinking about how we should be living in the future, how our cities should be organized, how our transport systems should um, be developed and run. Um, another friend from that era ended up in marketing. He worked for a big international marketing company. Someone else did um, transport management. Someone else worked in um, another kind of management consultancy. Like many humanities subjects, it can have a vocational value in its own right, but also particularly after university course, it equips you with all sorts of transferable skills linked to data analysis, evaluation, um, that can be taken up and seen as valuable by various employers. Okay, that's me. I've told you about me already. So the course is like A-level courses throughout um, the country, two years long. It consists of eight major elements which are on the screen at the moment some of these you will i am sure have covered before or have come across before if you um have been studying gcse geography as i expect most of you have you don't have to have studied uh, gcse geography to do the course but clearly it's an advantage and nearly everyone on the course will have done that so plate tectonics earthquakes, volcanoes, planetary movements of the crust, coastal geography to do with the physical and human environments on the edges of land where it meets the sea and how those change and develop over time, globalization, uh, essentially a human phenomenon involving trade, um, wealth, prosperity, communications, politics, power structures, culture, Regenerating places is concerned with how areas which have undergone change, particularly that have undergone um, downgrading in some way, maybe they've lost their major industry or there's been a decline in the buildings of the area, people have left the area, it has become in need of um, improvement. How that improvement, how that giving of new life can happen is the central theme of regenerating places. So our local good example of that would be the whole area around Stratford, what is now the Olympic Park, um, the Westfield Shopping Centre, are very good local examples of regenerating places. All of those units form the first year of the course. <clears throat> in addition to that, in the following year, in A2, we look at water and water insecurity, um, that's to say how people get um, their supplies of drinking water, water for industry and farming, um, problems of having too much water or too little water. That flows on to another particularly important and very topical topic of energy insecurity. This is looking at how we use energy in the world, particularly carbon, coal, oil, natural gas, um, the challenges that poses for the environment and for the future sustainability of the planet. So it brings us into things like climate change uh, and how energy is um, moved around the world, how it's used and the impacts of that. Um, Superpowers is nothing to do with Marvel comics. It is all to do with the big countries of the world and how they uh, exert power and influence throughout the world. 
the United States, China, Russia, India, to some extent, Britain, France, and some other powers. That usually proves to be a very popular model. It's always incredibly topical because there's always something happening in the news um, that one or other of those powers has been involved in. And the last section is one on human development. So it's looking at how the planet is changing, the populations of different countries are growing in their prosperity, in their trade, or in some cases are failing to share in that development and the reasons for that. So the whole thing is assessed by three exams at the end of A2, which for your um, year group will be in the summer of 2023, plus uh, an in individual investigation, also known as the NEA, which is more easily referred to as the fieldwork project. Um, those are all external exams set by the exam board, which is Edexcel, also known as Pearson. In addition to that, though, the college has a whole series of internal assessments which take place roughly every half term, and those are intended to help us as teachers to judge and assess how well you're doing against what we would expect you to be doing at certain stages of the course. Um, some of those are bigger than others, and the ones which are particularly significant are our mock exams at key points in the two-year cycle. Okay, field work. Um, field work has been strange in the last year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in normal years, this is the place which um, several groups from NUVIC have studied in recent years. It's the Norfolk coast, about two and a half to three hours coach trip from London. And the plan would be to take um, a group of A1 students on a field trip to this part of the coastline to give you the experience of seeing some real geography out in the field, measuring it, discussing it, setting up challenges, setting problems. That can either be the basis of your study or you can use some of the techniques and ideas and insights you've gained there to set up your own study closer to home maybe somewhere in London. Okay, so this is gonna be now a taster session. So if we were doing this in real life, um, then this will be far more interactive. I'll be asking individual people and groups questions and there'll be some more paper involved and things will be moving around the classroom um, to try and get people to see things from different perspectives and so on. Now, for much of this year, we have been doing online lessons. I'm fairly certain that you've probably been doing the same in your individual schools for your GCSE work there. It means that we have to do things slightly differently. Now, um, I'm not going to try and use jam boards today because that would mean I had to invite you all and it would get complicated. So I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible by giving you this question, what is globalization? Uh, and the learning objective there to know what it is and look at some of the advantages and disadvantages it brings to particular countries, particularly rich countries and poor countries. Now, because I haven't got um, I haven't got uh, access to uh, you via paper. What I'm going to do is ask you to put things in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to look at the chat and see what we've got there and what responses you can make in the chat. So let's go on. So globalization, what do I know already? What I'd like you to do is put into the chat any ideas? What are your thoughts? What is globalization? What do you know about it from what you've already found out in the last years? So if you put your ideas in the chat, that will be great. Off you go.
Okay. If you if you're not used to if you're not used to um, um, Google Classroom and where things are found, the chat is if you go along the bottom of your screen where there's a kind of a information bar, then there are various symbols. The one you need to get for chat is down there. Uh, it's got a kind of a, a speech bubble. If you could put something in the chat, that would be great. What do you think globalization is? Just just a few words would be would be great. Noor, can I just check? Can you hear me, Noor? So we can hear you, but they're just typing some messages. Oh, they are typing. I just wanted to make sure because I was on present. I couldn't see whether you could uh, you could see me. That's great. Okay, thank you. Right, so, ah, oh, great. So let's have a look. Um, I'm not gonna read every single word, you'll be glad to hear. But Noah says, different meanings, development of organizations and connections to the wider world. Vine has put growing interdependence, very important word, that one, interdependence, meaning the interlinking of different uh, world economies and countries. And the KV twins, when countries grow to increase the world economics, providing more jobs. Okay, so it's about growth and dependence. Arif has put the process by which the world becomes more connected by trading with each other to improve life for everyone. Brilliant. Okay, you all, you've all got different aspects there and you're all touching on different things which are indeed important for this whole process. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide. This is um, looking at different aspects of what globalization covers. And as you can see, some of the things you've already mentioned are up there. We're looking at networks, interconnections between different countries, different societies, trade, culture, that kind of link. We're also looking at um, how people move from one place to another, where they their kind of ancestors originated, how they've migrated around the world, how they've moved from maybe rural areas into cities, a process called urbanization, um, and what are the consequences of all that movement for both the people themselves, the places they move into, and the places they have come from. So migration is really important. Uh, another key part of this element of the course is groupings of nations, how countries get together for their mutual benefit in different ways, either for trade or for defense, for um, sustaining the environment. There's all sorts of different groupings that exist within the world for that purpose. So it is a very complex area and one which there are different facets to, which is one key element of this A-level geography course we're doing. So next slide is using kind of cartoons and symbols to try and say something about what the effects of some of this globalization is. Now, if I can get rid of the chat, yeah, get rid of the chat there. What I'd like to do this time is go back to the chat and it doesn't matter which one, but just choose any of those images that you can see there and try and look at what the message is from the image. Now, there's a cartoon there. In fact, there's more than one cartoon. And there are some obviously made up, curated, photoshopped images. Each one has got some kind of message though. It may be um, parodying adverts or, or kind of subverting adverts. 
it's trying to say something about um, different aspects of globalization and who benefits from globalization, what, who are the main agents, who are the main groups of people who are bringing about change. So in the chat, either write something that one of these um, images tells you about or speaks to you about, or if you want to ask a question, then that's also fine. You could ask a question about why is the woman in the left carrying a gigantic can of Coke with a, a hamburger on her head? What's all that supposed to be about? Um, what's the message there? If you think you can decipher it anyway, that's fine. You can write that or you can write a message or a question into the, the chat box. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute. Either a question or anything you like, Put it in the chat. Off we go. I'll leave you a minute without constantly interrupting. Okay, so carry on writing, by the way, while I'm talking. If you want to put anything else in the chat, that's fine. So what have I got? I've got uh, Vinay has said, the, the wealthy get richer and the poor get poorer. That's clearly the message of at least this diagram, this kind of uh, graphic here, which is like a, a globe where if you look at the top of the globe, then there are smiley faces and at the bottom, um, people who are sad and oppressed. You can read that in different ways. One is that the North tends to be the part of the world which other things being equal has more wealthy countries, whereas the South, South of the equator, South of the Mediterranean maybe, has countries at lower levels of development. Um, this one here is telling a similar story about um, the so-called fat cats, in other words, wealthy industrialists who seem to be making a fortune from um, the power that they have in the world system, while down below many poorer people are being kind of thrown off and discarded by the way that world is changing. Um, you may have heard about the, the changes that have occurred during the, the last 15 months of pandemic whereby some of the wealthiest people in the world, um, Bezos, the guy in charge of uh, Amazon, uh, his wealth has gone up by billions. And that's true of other uh, multi-billionaires, Elon Musk and so on. They are profiting massively by the fact that people are going increasingly online for their shopping and so on. Therefore, at the expense, really, of other people who are not able to kind of share that um, increase in the wealth it tends to be going to some people rather than others. Um, let's have a look at someone else's comment. HICs, that's high income countries, are benefiting from globalization as they receive the goods from low income countries, indeed. So there's, there are very elaborate models to try and, try and show that relationship, but that's definitely going on there. Um, Arif has said it's similar to the idea of the Brandt line. Um, the Brandt line um, was devised many years ago now, about 40 years ago in the 1980s, by um, someone who had been Chancellor of Germany. He went on to work for the United Nations, and he, um, he really divided the world up with a kind of a nice, neat line into developed and developing, or if you like, high-income and low-income countries. And that line was a kind of squiggly line going around the world, north of which was most of Europe, Canada, United States, um, and Japan, and a few other developed countries, and south of which were the poor countries. That's not so popular anymore because I think most researchers in the field realize that that's oversimplifying things. The world is quite complicated. There are some, there are some truths in that. Um, the United States is certainly a wealthy country. Um, 
However, as time moves on, it's increasingly the case that there are, there are variations from one country to another, and even within countries. There are some very poor people in the United States, and there are some wealthy people in otherwise developing nations in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a complicated pattern. Um, Nora said, taking over economic growth rather than ethical values. So that's absolutely true, that the way the world operates is often based on money and wealth and power, and that higher ethics uh, seem not to be significant for many of the key players in our world system. That may always have been the case, of course. I don't think I um, believe in an idea that the world is somehow much worse than it ever was or, or much better than it ever was, but things tend to uh, not change in terms of fundamental ethics. A couple of other things that um, I could point out to you on here. This one here, the one with the strange tree, is the idea that these multinationals like um, HSBC, Shell, McDonald's, and so on, uh, IBM, which is a computer business, and Nike, they have their branches and roots spreading throughout the world, and they are kind of getting their wealth and their energy from all over the world. This one is also about multinationals being a bit like the new armies of the world. In other words, they can ob obtain resources and power and influence. These companies don't need soldiers on the ground to get control of places. They can do it by their power, their money. Um, this one is saying that it's hard to see, it's a bit smaller, I realize now, I'll look at it again, but that every high street is getting increasingly the same. Wherever you are in the world, it's got a Starbucks, a McDonald's, a KFC, the same brands you'll see in London, Munich, Tokyo, Cairo, Sao Paulo, throughout the world, we're becoming very, very uniform and similar. This strange image here of the, the woman Looks like she's somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and the idea here is that she is kept in the way she is living. She is supporting the fast food industry. Her water has possibly been taken by Coca-Cola to make their Coke and sell it back to her. And the land, which maybe she used to use for her own farming, is now being gathered and co-opted to produce beef for burgers. Um, obviously, there are lots of arguments to be had here, lots to be said, but these are just some starting points for discussion. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide now. This is just going. This is sorry. This is just going through those slides, but a bit bigger. You can see a bit more detail. That's the um, the idea of TNCs or transnational corporations as acting as if they were powerful countries with armies. There's the rich and poor world. There's the fat cats. We didn't look at that one, but this is the idea of the globalization has these negative environmental impacts to do with air pollution, um, water quality, and so on, which we are becoming increasingly aware of. So we've looked at some ideas here. What I would like you to do now, and this is the last part of the lesson, if you like, is to try and gather things together. I'm going to show you um, a couple of slides. As I'm showing you the slides now, I want you to try and note down. You can put it in the chat if you want, or you can just write it on a scrap of paper somewhere. But I'd like you to just pick out one thing, or at least one thing, from each of these slides, which you think is important or significant. And they're all in some way connected to the process of globalization. So here we go, slide one. This is a woman working in a factory making jeans. If you look behind her, you'll see it's a massive factory. Um, try to think about what she might be gaining from this or what she might be losing? What are the pluses and minuses for this person working in a 
a clothing factory. We don't know exactly where it is, but let us assume it's in a developing country like the Philippines. Okay, here's a graph showing what's happened to the trade in goods, which is the dark blue line on this graph, uh, and the trade, or not sorry, and the and the changes in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there's a clear link between these two in terms of as one is rising, so is the other. They're not exactly the same trend lines, but they do appear to be linked on this. So just try and think of a couple of things on that. Again, we're looking at pluses of globalization and negative impacts of globalization. Whenever you see a graph like this, try and um, punctuate your uh, summary or your, your kind of observations with maybe a couple of dates from the, the, um, the bottom axis and maybe a couple of values. Now, the, the exporting goods in dollars is the left-hand scale. So that's the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 US dollars, I think in billions. Oh, no, it's by an index number. And then on the right-hand scale, it's the greenhouse gas emissions in gigatons of carbon dioxide on the right-hand scale. So what's going on there? Pluses and minuses again. The next slide, I'm going to leave that one out. The next slide is inequality. Now, this is an interesting idea. The idea here is um, the more unequal a society is, the higher the graph line goes. Now, inequality isn't exactly the same as just wealth. In other words, you could have a very equal society, which is quite wealthy. Classic example usually given is Slovenia. It's not very rich, but it's fairly wealthy, but it's a very even society. Whereas the United States is a very wealthy society, but it's much less even. Income is much uh, more polarized, there's a few very rich people and there are many poor people. So as those gra graph lines are going up, getting higher up as we go from left to right, that means increasing inequality. So the United States definitely becoming more unequal as time has gone on. And the scale is 1980 through to 2015. Whereas the UK has got more unequal, but not as unequal as the United States. And it's a little less clear, particularly in the last few years, what's happening there. Um, Poland is the very light gray. You'll see right at the beginning, it was very equal indeed. This was the period when it was communist. It then had a jump when it became a lot less equal there. And it's gradually become less equal as time's gone on. Uh, and then lastly, France, it has gone up in terms of inequality, but not as much as either the United States or the UK. So there's a few ideas there to kind of get your heads around. Um, this is the idea that globalization impacts all sorts of different things. Some of these we've touched on already. Um, let's pick on some that we haven't yet touched on. Threat to sovereignty. Sovereignty means a country's ability to make its own decisions, to make its own choices in the world and go along that line. So sovereignty is that. Whereas interdependence, just next to it on the left, is the extent to which countries are linked to each other through trade or defence treaties and other international agreements. Um, foreign direct investment, money flowing into countries from outside. And that one there is one we were just talking about in terms of inequality. Um, okay, so pluses and minuses there. We now come to this table. Now, we've just got a few minutes left. So what I want you to do is, um, on the chat now, and 
we're trying to classify all the ideas that we've come across. So this first panel is looking at rich countries and how they have benefited from globalization. So this could be rich people in rich countries or poor people in rich countries, basically anyone who lives in the United States or France or Germany or the UK. How have we gained from globalization? What have been the good things for us? Off you go in the chat, any good things that have arisen from globalization which have affected the, the richer countries of the world. I'm going to start us off. Okay, so I've said about clothes and other goods and services being there's a wider variety available and um, we can get them more cheaply than we could have done in real terms uh, maybe 50 years ago. Um, Vinay's put, um, from the company's point of view, they can, they can get their goods produced at a lower cost because they, they can outsource to maybe a country where the, the pay rates are much lower so they can get things made uh, much more easily. And cheaply. Um, Noor said there's a wider market for companies based in our um, rich countries. They can sell their goods to more people. Think of the car companies who are advertising heavily at the moment during the Euro 2020 uh, programs. They've got a vast global market now they wouldn't have had 50 years ago. More people to buy their goods and services. So that's all happening there. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, the next one is, okay, what are the disadvantages for people living in rich countries? How might things that have happened or are happening, how might they have negative impacts on people living in the UK or people living in Germany or people living in the United States? How might we lose out what might be a downside from globalization? Right. Well done, Vinay. You've anticipated what I was going to suggest. Um, job displacement. In other words, jobs that would have existed in a factory in Lancashire, making clothes maybe, or making cars, are now being relocated to places where the company can get it done more cheaply, which leads to unemployment, job losses, uh, and therefore uh, there's a loss there. Thank you for that, Vinay. Noor has said loss of culture and traditions. This is given the buzz phrase of cultural erosion. Um, if there's been a very traditional way of doing things in a particular Indian state, and that is all now changing because of big transnational corporations locating there and doing things in a different way, that can indeed erode um, traditional values, cultural values, even affect religious uh, observance in some cases. So there are disadvantages for um, richer countries. Let's move to the next one. Who gains in poorer countries from globalization? Do they gain at all? Is there anything good for them? Anything good happening in Egypt or Vietnam or Brazil or let's choose another one, Kenya? Anything coming out of globalization which is to their advantage? Let me think.
So um, I put jobs. Vinay has put uh, increased trade with poorer com poorer companies, okay, or poor countries as well. Um, Noor has put increase of services such as hospitals, so health and quality of life may improve in some of these poor and developing nations, you mean countries, okay. Um, uh, I put potential for greater economic growth. China has had spectacular success in this. The, the number of people living in absolute poverty in China has gone down massively in the last 40 years um, as they have embraced the, the world economy on a scale which has never been seen before anywhere. So there are advantages. There are disadvantages, of course, but there are advantages to be had there. And that takes us to the, the final box, which is, okay, um, disadvantages for people living in poorer nations in the South, LICs, if you like, or developing countries. How have they lost out? We've already touched on this, I suppose. We saw that um, image of the woman working in the clothing factory. Uh, what, what are the downsides for some of these people? I'm going to have my own thoughts here. Um, Noor's got a good one there, unequal, unequal economic opportunities. I've got exploitation of workers, long hours, may be separated from their families because they've moved to a distant city looking for work. Um, so there could be displacement going on, lack of, lack of local businesses involved in this that often tends to be the big transnational corporations who are scooping up all the economic activity. Thank you for that, Vinay and Noor. Okay, so there's, there's, there's lots to be said. Of course, we've just touched the surface of all the things that we could possibly be talking about here. But I just wanted to give you a flavor this afternoon of some of the issues, some of the interlinkages which exist within this part of the course. Uh, and that's true of nearly every part of the course. There's lots of interlinkage going on. So I don't think we've really got time to do this now, but I'll just throw this one out for you to think about. If you were asked to write a definition of globalization for the Oxford English Dictionary, how would you define it? Now, there are literally tens of different definitions available from different researchers, different universities, different dictionaries, but no one definition is perfect and complete. So you could very easily write your own and claim it as having a value. You can focus on different elements of this whole wider concept of globalization. But I'm afraid we haven't really got time for that now because I'm nearing the end of my time allocation. So um, that's another question which we haven't really got time for, I'm afraid, we've run out of time. But what can governments or businesses or societies do to um, maximize the advantages and minimize the disadvantages of what happens as a result of globalization? This is kind of a utilitarian response, if you like. Okay, that's me nearly done for today. Just to remind you at the very end, um, that enrollment day is Thursday, the 12th of August this summer. Uh, it's slightly different from in previous years, so please bear, uh, take good note of that. If you've already applied to the college, you will get another link via email to enroll, just to remind you. If you haven't already applied, though, there's a link on the screen, nuvic.ac.uk dash apply. Either way, once you've got your final GCSE results, click on the link and upload your results and then wait for a phone call or an email from the college to help you complete the process of enrolling. So I hope you all do decide to enroll at NUVIC. I think you would have a, a great time here and that you've got lots of opportunities out, out there available for you. When you do enroll, I hope you enroll for geography, obviously, um, but there are, there's a wide range of really interesting A-level courses. There are other courses as well, but A-levels are particularly um, close to my heart and those are the people in the humanities. So please do enroll and 
make sure that you don't miss these kind of key dates and key points to upload your results and make sure you're included in the enrollment process. So I'm going to say goodbye for now. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't meet in person, but hopefully by the time we get to the autumn term, um, things will have improved in the wider world. Okay, thank you. And you can now log off. Bye-bye.